Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this one is Cisco QoS Design and Best Practices for Enterprise Networks. I'm Patrick Hubbard, Head Geek here at SolarWinds, and with me on the call is Ken Briley. Hi Patrick. Hi guys. Hey, how are you doing? Pretty good. Ken is, um, I want, is actually a guy who wrote the book on uh, implementing best practices for enterprise networks and QoS. Tell us a little bit about what you do uh, as a technical lead at Cisco. Uh, so Patrick, uh, I've been at Cisco for about 13 years. Um, I, I moved around from land switching, started out there, went into uh, 3K, 4K, 6K business units, mainly focusing on quality of service, and then found myself uh, in advanced services working end-to-end -end designs for uh, a lot of the customers here at Cisco Systems. Um, right now I'm in NOSTG, which is the uh, technology group that owns all of the OSs. Um, for Cisco Systems, and I work quality of service on on all of the uh, the platforms basically across Cisco. That's fantastic. Um, I, again, I love these uh, webinars where we get to have a chance to have real geeks on board. And um, the, your presentation has got some slides that in it uh, that I really have enjoyed looking at while we've gotten prepped for this. Um, let's uh, just dive on in here. Um, what we're going to cover today is uh, the most the, the body of it, we'll, we'll be talking about QoS design and best practices, obviously. And then toward the end, we'll talk a little bit about uh, CBQOS reporting using NTA and some of the new features in uh, 4.0. Um, feel free to ask questions at any time using the question panel. Um, this is completely interactive. We're going to try to make sure that we've got some time at the end. Um, but if you have questions that we don't answer, we will reply to you uh, through email um, at the end with answers. Um, just a quick overview about SolarWinds, and then I'm going to hand this over to Ken, and um, he's going to talk for quite a bit. I'm going to jump in with some questions um, along the way, um, and then we'll wrap it up with Q&A. I think all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with SolarWinds. I mean, we've de been delivering uh, for over a decade now um, IT management software that's really easy to set up to use, and um, it's increasingly powerful every year. I mean, um, particularly with the release of uh, the latest version of NTA with 4.0, with flow storage, um, really um, uh, all available for you to download off of the website. Um, this slide, actually, the number of customers is incorrect. It's more than 100,000 customers and uh, more than 170 company, uh, countries now. So um, I think, I can't think of too many folks who haven't used at least some of our free tools, especially things like um, at a minimum, the uh, TFTP server and a couple of other things. So let's dive right on in here to uh, Ken's part of the presentation and talk about QoS design. All right, guys. So um, again, I've already introduced myself, so let's just go ahead and jump to the next slide here. We're going to really focus in on end-to-end um, -end QoS design and strategy. We'll start out uh, with a a basic overview, and then we'll we'll convince you um, that you need to deploy Campus QoS because uh, it always seems like that's uh, that's usually the sticking point there. Most customers deal with WAN, and and when they think of QoS, that's where they go first. But uh, the first section will be Campus, then we'll jump into WAN, and then we'll uh, go over a quick summary um, and take any questions if you guys have them um, towards the end, and we'll have a couple of references there. You'll see this in every presentation, and Patrick, go ahead and flip through the whole slide here. Um, we'll basically see that, you know, the trends going going up are essentially, you know, more traffic, eightfold. You're going to see all sorts of numbers like this. Is that, you know, nowadays essentially wireless traffic is going to exceed wired. We're going to see more video on the network. By 2010, we're going to have tons of non-PC traffic, which means smartphones, tablets, and all of that good stuff on the network today. And one of the increasing things that we're going to see is BYOD out there, which is, is really prevalent. We're seeing a lot of video downstream to these devices. Um, and all of these trends are typical. We've been seeing this over the last 10 years, right? So the first slide that you always see in any QoS presentation is beware, recognize that traffic is changing. There's going to be a lot of traffic types out there that you don't know about. Um, and today, the big thing is video. Um, and video, HD video specifically, is something that can really uh, dig into your network. And you really want to know a bit more about it. And we'll cover that here and what to do with HD video um, in a bit. The next piece you always talk about is the, the trends towards voice video, video and uh, data media applications. We, we have more collaborative applications like Link and Jabber, um, internal to Cisco now. Um, we have all sorts of collaborative media, which means 
the question comes up whether or not we should separate the voice and the video traffic. Um, what about the unmanaged traffic? What do we do with the data applications? Um, any sort of collaborative application has multiple facets, multiple pieces, and those individual streams or those individual flows um, all have different requirements. So how do we handle those? Um, and that's a question that arises from time to time. Do we segment them? Do we mark them differently? And in most cases, it really depends on your business needs. But um, recognizing the fact that it's becoming more complex and we need better classification um, in terms of NBAR or metadata that we may have, um, as opposed to just typical ACL, um, is one of the improvements we've made over time um, to quality service. And that's, that's one thing that, that we really need to take a look at. So again, the trend is, is becoming more complicated. We see more collaborative media out there. Now, with that, basically, that collaborative media, it leads us to the classification, and this RFC is basically your best friend when it comes to quality of service, because it really provides you with a really good guideline of the application class or how you'll sort applications by specific uh, technical requirements and the per-hop behavior uh, or the DSCP value that you can associate to that traffic class, if you will. Um, the idea here is to really provide you with at least a, a reasonable idea of how to group applications, how they should be marked, and then some examples over there on the right. Now, Cisco kind of differs a bit on, on one of these uh, media classes. You'll see that call signaling in CS5, um, basically Cisco believes that the priority queue is extremely important. And honestly, if you look at the WAN, the priority queue costs you a bit of money. Um, if you go to gold car or you pay for your priority queue, you recognize that. The more bandwidth you request for that specific queue, um, the more you're going to pay. So the less bandwidth you have in there, honestly, the, the better it is basically for, uh, for the company because you're going to save money on the bottom line. And removing call signaling from the priority queue itself by, by allowing it to be marked CS3 in most instances is, is basically a better choice. Um, CS3 and CS5, again, this is an informational RFC, um, have basically just been toggled here. So the call signaling, again, on all Cisco devices by default is set to CS3 so that we don't really need that signaling traffic in the priority queue. It doesn't have the same requirements um, as voice bearer traffic. And I can't believe you'd throw Xbox Live in the scavenger category. Yeah, well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's based on your business requirements, I guess. Now, uh, it's not, this slide's not pretty, and it's, it's really not meant to be. I mean, the reality is, is this is RFC 5865. I mean, this, it's the next generation RFC that kind of incorporates all of the, the additional classes. So we went from a 12 class to a 15 in this one. Um, and that incorporates admitted and non-admitted traffic classes. So you'll notice basically the admitted, non-admitted are up there at the top in the video reference. Um, and this is when you have uh, like a call manager or something like that, that has the ability to mark down admitted and non-admitted flows and to make differentiation uh, between the two, actually. So when you, when you look at this, it, it, it just really appears to be very complex. And it really is, sadly. Okay, so um, this RFC, because it is informational, it gives you a, a lot more detail uh, into what applications are out there and how to group them. So it tries to to provide a bit of information for you, again, on how to separate different video types. If you have an admitted call versus non-admitted, you may want to mark them differently. But if your network isn't this complex and you don't have all of these individual applications running into it, what do I do? We start looking at different models. And we look at a five class and eight, 15 classes in there. Um, but most customers will start at either a five or an eight class model. Um, and some of them, if they, if they really want to endure, um, will move to a 12-class model. Now, the reality is, is that you only have a few different markings here. So on a 5-class, you'll literally have five markings. That doesn't mean you'll have, you won't see AF3 in a 5-class model, realistically. So you want to keep your, your classification, your marking, simple. If you have a 5-class model, you move to an 8 to get a bit more granularity. Um, the idea here is to keep QS simple. I mean, that's, that's you're going to hear me repeat that over and over, but... Uh, the reality is, is if you make it overly complex, you have to manage the classification that's tied to a basic policy. So when you look at the overall end-to-end -end design strategy, you can start with a five-class model and then leave all that excess traffic in your best effort queue. And then from that standpoint, we can 
look at that specific queue and if there's video types that need to be removed from there, we can prioritize them by moving to an eight class model. And that's really the idea is, is grow with your QS policy, grow with your network, um, and again, keep it as simple as you possibly can. Here's a, just a quick uh, slide, and these slides will be uh, handed out to you guys, so uh, take a look at this. This is on uh, Cisco.com um, or CCO as we call it internally. Um, this basically describes that entire section, um, overviews, you know, the application explosion, the collaboration, what you should do there, what the different RFCs are, and, and the 5, 8, and 12 class model, um, just again for your reference. This is a really handy reference, and I've, I've spent a lot of time taking a look at this site. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to have to convince you that Campus QoS is, is important, because most people, when they look at the campus, they think, well, I have 10 gig channels, or I have 1 gig channels. How could I possibly uh, drop any traffic? Well, I'm not worried about latency there, am I? Um, and the reality is, no, you're not worried about latency. You're more worried about loss. That's the big concern. Latency and jitter really aren't that big of a concern um, because you are dealing with 10 gig in most instances. But in 1 in 10 gig campus networks, as you're going to find out in the next couple slides, it takes only a few milliseconds to really congest the link. Um, and that's really what we're concerned about. We want to make sure that we schedule the, the traffic appropriately. If HD video is extremely important to you, um, for instance, like telepresence or other video mechanisms that do use HD, you want to schedule that accordingly. You want to give it the correct bandwidth so that you don't lose packets because, as you'll see in the next few slides, it can be bad. So, as mentioned here, one packet in every 10,000 for an HD flow it can easily cause user disruption. You can see it. So, we do the math on the right side, and basically, in a 1080 by 1920 screen, which is just a, a 1080p flow or one video screen, you're going to see that that's about 1.5 gigs uncompressed. Now, because of the H.264 codec, we compress that thing down to 3 to 5 meg, but the reality is you've got a 1.5 gig uncompressed stream within that, that, that flow. So that means if you drop one single packet, you're really dropping a lot more data than you think. So users, again, a single packet here is, is going to, in, inside of 10,000, is going to be 100 times more sensitive to packet loss you know, than voice. So HD in general is 100 times more sensitive. So it's extremely important to recognize that loss is really what you're protecting yourself from within the campus. You don't want to drop packets if HD video is extremely important to you. Now, here's a comparison. Generally, um, when we look at quality of service, we compare voice to HD video. It's kind of a joke. I mean, the reality is, is voice back in the day was important, and it still is. But if you look at it, it's incredibly deterministic, and it's very easy on the network as far as looking at a G711 or G722 call. Um, you're looking at 20 millisecond audio samples and very small amounts of data. When you look at video, it really depends on the shirt of the guy and the camera on the other side. It, it could be massive like the, the middle frame or it could be fairly light like the first frame. But the reality is, is that the amount of data, um, the amount of bandwidth required for HD video is completely different um, than, than voice today. And that's something that we really need to take into consideration when we do our classification um, and we do uh, quality service within the network is a lot of traffic out there these days is HD video and it may not be business centric. So the next piece that we talked about was that it's, it's fairly easy to, uh, to oversubscribe buffers on line cards. Now the reality is, is that the 6148A shown here is a, is a very standard line card. It's gig rate. Um, and it provides gig throughput just fine. But if I throw HD video calls uh, or HD video in general on this line card, it'll only take, it'll take about 11 milliseconds to fill up the buffer on this guy. Now, that's not because the buffer's undersized. That's just because you're dealing with a massive amount of traffic. And burstiness based on video, it's also on this 10 gig line card, you can see it's about 9 milliseconds. So the burstiness because of the HD video is extremely important to take into consideration. So if we don't provision properly, if we don't configure quality of service within the campus, we're going to run into packet loss on potentially incredibly important video calls um, that your manager or your boss could possibly be having. All right. So 
The basic design principles for quality of service, as always, are perform QS and hardware rather than software. And most of the time, um, customers, when they first look at quality of service, they think about the WAN specifically. But the reality is, is again, as we've just proven, it's easy to oversubscribe the campus. So you need to uh, definitely configure quality of service to the access edge um, to make sure that, number one, you're performing the QS and hardware to offload CPU, um, to, to offload anything you possibly can from the WAN routers themselves, because they may be doing things like DPI, which are processor intensive. Um, classification and marking is extremely important at the edge because we establish something called a trust boundary. So as traffic comes in or flows come in, um, it's just like uh, somebody walking into a building. You, you make sure they badge in before they, they're allowed into the network. Well, the idea with establishing the trust boundary is as an application or a flow comes into your switch, you don't have to trust the marking. You can mark it whatever you want. So better to try to classify based on ACL or something to identify that flow so that it gets queued properly throughout the network. And then policing uh, unwanted traffic flows is just kind of common sense. If you limit the traffic at the access edge, um, then you, you realistically don't have to worry about excess traffic in your distribution, your core, or on your WAN. If you have traffic that you really don't want to hit the WAN, you could easily just drop it there at the access edge. So don't let it in the network um, if it doesn't need to be there. And then queuing, queuing is what guarantees QoS. If you don't have queuing in your, in your core or if you don't have queuing on your WAN, there is no guarantee. What queuing basically is going to do for you is make sure that based on your markings and all of that policing and all that work you did at the edge, um, at each egress hop uh, on the edge and the core and the distribution um, in the WAN, you're going to make sure that you fulfill those specific queues based on a certain bandwidth requirement. So 30% allocation for some specific queue. Um, is actually a positive thing, right? So you're going to adhere to that 30%, for instance. So some of the, the QS tools um, and, and some of the options here that we'll talk about is the global trust uh, or the, the trust states or conditional trust that we deal with uh, Cisco IP phones um, and also telepresence. Um, per port QS versus per VLAN. Per port for VLAN is another option on the, the Catalyst uh, 4K and 3K. Um, standard QS models, Ether channel QS, um, and one thing I want to mention here is in this campus section, we generally talk about MLS because that's usually the 3750 and the classic 4K um, and also the 6500 in some cases. But these are all MLS-based switches. Now, the next-gen line of switches, the 3850 that, that just came out recently, the 4K with SOUP 6, 7, and 8, and the 6K SOUP 2T are all MQC-based. So they're more, they're more like a router, realistically, um, and they don't use the MLS command set. And so you'll see a, a little bit of difference there. But in this specific section, we're really focused on the MLS-based switches. All right. So in the campus, um, on all of these MLS-based switches, you're going to see trust states. So you see untrusted, trust, and trust DSCP down there for cost and, and DSCP. By default, everything is untrusted on these MLS-based switches. One thing you'll notice differently is MQC. We do trust everything by default, keeping in line with the, the router-based platform. Now, untrusted basically means you've got an internal DSCP value, and you rewrite that cost and DSCP are zero. If we trust costs, all the cost does is basically looks, we look at the cost value of five, and we basically overwrite cost five, or not cost five, but the DSCP value based on the internal cost to DSCP mapping table. Um, so we carry that internal DSCP value, and on the egress, we do the rewrite. Same thing with DSCP. We trust the DSCP. That means we overwrite the cost value on the egress side uh, based on the internal DSCP. So that's extremely important to note. The next piece that we're actually going to talk about is, is basically um, um, is, is basically the, the trust or conditional trust operation that we deal with um, when it comes to either IP phones or Cisco telepresence in units, right? So the idea here is, is with conditional trust, um, the IP phone itself can be extended to trust so that the, the phone itself can remark traffic from the PC that comes into the phone and goes further into the system. Essentially what will happen is, is the, the PC port on the back of the phone, um, the cost values will come in or DSCP values will come in from the PC. Um, the phone itself, because CDP validated that it's a Cisco phone, will go ahead and mark the traffic um, from the PC port to zero for the, for the cost value 
and then the phone itself will send uh, cost three as well as uh, a, a DSCP value of 46 for the voice bearer traffic or if you've got video AF41 um, directly into the system and the box the the switch itself connected that did the conditional trust will will literally uh, trust the value the DSCP and the cost value is associated now generally we say trust cost um, for uh, phones and also Cisco telepresence well in the instance of telepresence we say DSCP because the phone port the port behind the phone should actually be shut down in that case but for phones for Cisco phones since we extended that conditional trust the phone remarks cost it doesn't remark DSCP um, and essentially what will happen is, is that um, we want to trust cost on the physical switch port otherwise what could possibly happen is the PC behind the phone um, can send the DSCP value, it could go through the phone and then into the, the switch itself. So anytime that you do that, you want to make absolutely sure that you do trust the DSC, uh, the cost value rather on the switch port attached to a Cisco phone. So the standard trust boundary is, is basically something, again, we establish as kind of like a key card effect. We want to make sure that the flows or the applications that come into the network are directly tied into what our business requirements are. So Three options here is uh, to conditionally trust the, the phone. Again, as we, we were talking about, the phone is a border. Um, it's essentially going to remark the PC traffic to zero, or it could mark it something else if you'd like. But normally it's set to zero, and then the phone itself will send you know cost values of three and, and uh, uh, basically five directly to the switch. We'll take those cost values and mark uh, remap them based cost to DSCP, like we talked about on the previous slide. Um, and then that traffic will go through the system. But the idea here is, is that we establish a boundary. Um, the next piece is the uh, uh, secured endpoint. So we could trust the endpoint because we have some sort of application or uh, um, some sort of uh, uh, supplicant based on the, the system there. The unsecured endpoint is going to be just a standard PC. On that switch port, we're not going to want to, uh, to trust that device at all. So um, end users, generally, we try not to trust because who knows what they're going to do, either on purpose or accident. Um, the next piece is per port versus per VLAN quality of service. And there's a lot of discussion around this. It depends on, um, realistically, the amount of policies you want to deploy, how large the policy is, and also really what you want um, to do from a QoS standpoint. On a per port policy, you just apply the policy to a port. Everything on that physical port has to pass through that policy in order to uh, adhere to the, you know, the QoS requirement. So if you set, you mark, you police, it's all going to be based on that port. If you do a, a VLAN-based policy, again, it's going to be an aggregate as opposed to an individual port. So everybody coming into that VLAN is going to be subjected to that specific VLAN. Now, it could be a port ap applied to a SVI or a, a Layer 2 um, entity uh, as a VLAN but it doesn't really make a difference. It's still going to be an aggregate. So anytime you create a policer on a VLAN policy, it's really just, um, it's, it's just a, a best guess realistically when it comes down to it. So if you have 10 phones, you're going to take 10 times 128K for the VLAN-based policy, whereas per port, it's going to be much easier because it's more granular. Now, one step further is VLAN, per port per VLAN-based policies. So we look at the VLAN on the individual port, and these policies from port to port can be different on a per VLAN basis. So the 4500 does a really good job of this in that on the physical port itself, you just have to configure the, the VLAN command and essentially tie the service policy directly to it. So you have a VLAN range command. You say VLAN 110, for instance, and that's your voice VLAN. You can tie a voice VLAN policy directly to that voice VLAN. And the same thing with the data VLAN here as well. So separate policies, more granularity. And the reality is, is that um, a lot of customers really like this because you do have that capability to be more flexible. The ingress QoS model, um, to be honest, you're looking at the standard untrusted versus trust cost or DSCP that we just talked about. And then we have the trusted device. So it depends on which type of port you're dealing with. Is it an untrusted port, a trusted port, um, or in all instances, we may want to create a QoS policy associated to that port. Now, a QoS policy, and this is a standard recommendation for ingress, is an eight-class model that essentially takes into consideration voice, video, multimedia, transactional classes, 
and it marks them according to the standard RFC. The policing is optional, but realistically, when we look at policers within the network, um, there are a lot of overhead. There are a lot of management to, to really look at these individual policers. So the best practice recommendation is for voice signaling and other deterministic, like video-based applications. And when I say deterministic and video, I mean that loosely. But at least you have an idea of what the, the maximum codec value would actually be. So you can attach a policer to it um, associated to that individual class or that traffic and make sure that a virus doesn't happen to take over or something like that. But when you use policers, use, use them very conservatively because if you update your system, um, you may end up going back and revisiting all of your QS policies quite often because the police are set too low and you have to keep bumping it up. And then of course we have the voice VLAN and the data VLAN in this case. So we have a purport per VLAN based policies and that leads us to the ingress queuing. Now this is the, the typical ingress quality service model. When we look at queuing in general, um, Cisco's based it on this 1P XQYT model that's been around for some time. So you have one priority queue in this example, three queues, meaning three normal queues that are either SRR, WRR, or class-based weighted fare, FIFO queues. Um, and then you have eight thresholds in this specific example for those. Now, queuing does vary based on hardware, and there's a lot of discussion about that out there. People would like to see one queuing model across all platforms. Um, but the reality is that um, the reality is, is that every time we come up with new hardware, we want to extend the capabilities that are available today um, to customers. And that's why you keep seeing more queues or um, more thresholds or more priority queues, in fact. Um, and the reality is, is that more customers actually do use the capabilities that are there. So you will see a plethora of, of different queuing types and queuing structures, but they all follow the same overall expression of 1PXQYT. Now, general recommendations, best practice, are not to oversubscribe your priority queue. Leave it about a third of the overall link speed, um, but the reality is you can definitely go above that. The reason we say to leave it at a third is just so that the scheduler isn't being, um, isn't being monopolized by the priority traffic, because usually what happens is when a priority a packet comes into the priority queue, we schedule it first and foremost, which means we may subject the other traffic to drops or to loss, um, latency or jitter. And we don't want to do that. We want everything to work in accordance with the standards. We want to make sure that as flows go through, as traffic goes through, that it adheres to the, the, the standard business practices and it also makes all the applications usable to the best of our, our capabilities. So the, the idea behind the, that recommendation is, is that uh, the best effort, um, or sorry, the real-time queue shouldn't monopolize it. The best effort queue 25% recommendation there is really just to, to provide you with an idea that you need to provision bandwidth for everything else. So priority queue is important traffic that has low latency, best effort is everything else realistically. Now, scavenger and bulk, in today's times, we're, we're really looking at um, bulk and scavenger traffic as being kind of disruptive traffic to the network. Um, bulk is usually you know, the, the traffic type that is uh, some sort of backup that happens hopefully during the nighttime and doesn't disrupt your network during the day. But if it does happen to fire off during the day, you want to make sure that that traffic, that bulk traffic's not in your, your best effort queue. Because the reality is, is most of your traffic won't be classified because either you won't be able to classify it or you won't want to classify your 30,000 applications that are in your network today. So removing that bulk traffic will really enhance the, the capabilities of your, your class default because you won't be crushing the standard applications that happen to be in there. Now, the next piece is WAN QoS uh, design considerations. Basically, when it comes to the WAN, we don't really have to sell the idea of QoS here because um, everybody understands that if they have a T1 on one side of the router and a 100 meg on the other side, that it's, it's probably going to cause some problems, right? Um, but the reality is, is that today's times really requires that we look at more, uh, more developed classification techniques like NBAR or metadata to really dive into the individual applications, especially when it comes to HTTP, uh, to either classify that traffic as business-centric or business-critical, um, or to classify it as Bitbucket, as CS1. Now, um, on the, the ingress, here we see the LAN edge. We have an optional DSCP to cost mapping sort of thing where 
Um, our legacy switches don't really support DSCP. I don't really see that happen um, much anymore, but it's left there for, for those of you who do have um, fairly old switches. Uh, but the reality is, is that on that LAN edge, on the egress side towards the, the LAN side, we really don't need queuing um, in most instances, so you really won't see a queuing policy there. You may see classification and marking based on NBAR. Um, and those, those policies are really going to be a bit more granular in today's times when you're dealing with cloud or, or um, just you know, standard internet-based traffic. On the WAN edge, we do typical class-based weighted fare for the routers shaping as well as dropping. And one thing we didn't mention in the, uh, in the switch section was that a lot of the switches, to be honest, they don't do shaping. Um, they do policing. And the difference between those two uh, are quite huge. Shaping is going to allow us to, to back up the queue to buffer some of the traffic. Policing is just going to drop it at a cold CIR rate, which means if you have voice and video and data applications traveling through there, you configure a policer, you're going to drop the traffic based on that rate, so you could drop voice, video, and data. On the WAN edge, we want to provide a bit of a bit of back pressure with a shaper so that we can fill up individual queues so that we send out the, the priority queue traffic, like the voice and the video, uh, first and foremost, and essentially then provide for the other class-based weighted fair queuing queues. Now, there are a plethora of different types of, of connections, be it DMVPN or internet-based connections, um, uh, standard VPN connections, uh, flex VPN, all sorts of different VPN connection types. And we don't really cover that in detail, but there's a, a few SRNDs out there on um, QoS. The 4.0 version is, is the latest as, as of yet. And there's a VPN and a WAN one out there that you may want to check out um, because we don't really have time to cover all that in this individual section. Now, Again, on the WAN side, when we're looking at the, the points within the network, the green dot, essentially on the switches, we want to trust the traffic as it comes in. We want to make sure we trust that DSCP because the WAN device has already remarked the traffic, um, and trust is basically an ingress function. So as traffic comes in, we look at the DSCP values and allow it through. Then we do our queuing um, on the switch ports as we normally would because we want to do that from end to end. Um, on the router itself, you don't have to worry about trust. Um, and also, again, like I said, a lot of the next-gen switches that are out there, you don't have to trust because by default that's iOS, okay? That's the way we do it with MQC. Now, optionally, you'll have LLQ, class-based weighted fair, depending on um, your policy on the WAN uh, aggregation box. Usually, again, your uplink is going to be T1 or DS3 or something like that. That's going to be much slower than a gig link. So you won't have to worry about traffic going from the right to the left at least out the WAN aggregation port towards the, the LAN side of the house. On the uplink, on the uplink, the uplink is really the most important piece. This is where you need some synchronicity with either your service provider or you need to determine what you want to send over the internet. So if you've purchased a VPN um, based service from your service provider, and we'll see in the next couple slides, you want to link this up directly with their, their offering. Um, and you'll do that based on your internal, your 12 class model or whatever it happens to be. Now, um, you'll do some remarking here at, at this edge towards the provider in that case, because you generally will have to deal with a four or a six class model where you may go up to 12 um, in certain instances. The other thing to, to consider is that even if you're sending traffic out the internet, recognizing that there's really no quality of service out there, if you're dealing with a public cloud or, or cloud-based services, it's important that you look at that traffic and granularly define what you want to send um, from your router out to the internet. So you could send voice, if voice is more important to you, or video, allocate bandwidth to that and be very, very granular with that policy on that uplink uh, to make sure that you know, voice goes out before video, before your transactional applications, and you could even you know, stifle applications on ingress like Hulu or Netflix or whatever it happens to be internal to the network. Um, and the idea there is to make the best use of your bandwidth, even if it is internet-based bandwidth. So when you deal with the MPLS VPN design, there's all sorts of things that could actually occur. So you may have a hierarchical QoS shaper that, that provides you with a, a parent shape rate, and that rate's going to be provided to you by your provider. You're going to ask for a certain rate, either 10 meg, 100 meg, whatever it happens to be. Um, 
And then from there, you'll have class-based weighted fair queues associated with a, a low latency queue probably. And your priority queue is going to be your low latency queue. Um, and this is where essentially all of your voice traffic, possibly video, are going to go. And you'll pay a bit extra for that. Um, your standard queues, as we talked about before, it's going to be based on the amount of traffic that you want to send. Um, it's very difficult to give any one customer um, an idea of the amount of AF21 or transactional traffic that they're going to have in their network. It really depends on what you have, your business requirements. And this policy itself is going to be something that is going to take some time um, to discuss internally based on, again, business requirements, what applications you have. Is HD video critical to you? Is it going to go in the priority queue? Um, or is it going to stand in a, a standard class-based weighted fair queuing queue? How much are you going to pay for the, the priority queue uh, or golden car um, as we've talked about it before? And then on the service provider side, they basically just enforce your policy. So your, your objective is realistically to fold all of your values, if you have to, into the service provider policy and make sure that you adhere to their markings. And that could be a, a task upon itself. Um, working with the provider one-on-one -on -one is extremely important because you want to make sure that based on their individual classes that they are looking at CS5, for instance, or CS6, or are they using AF21 or AF31. There's, there should be no assumptions there at all. They should really outline that for you, provide that policy for you, and you should be able to pay based on a certain set of percentages for each of those classes. So two steps. Really verifying the uh, SP policy. You want to make sure that you know what you're getting from the provider directly. Um, and you also want to configure egress queuing. Now, here's an example where we go from the, the standard model to the service provider on the right. Um, we have, it looks to be a 12 class model on, here on the left. We're going to have to fold some of these values in what the provider offers. So you look at CS5, AF4, CS4. Um, and you see that we're remarking those values to, to different values associated with it. What we're going to see is on the other side of the house where this traffic comes out of the pipe from the service provider, we're going to have to classify that traffic based on ACL or NBAR to remove the, the CS2 value and remark it again CS5 so that we can provide it the treatment that it needs within our enterprise. So these are just marked um, or matched associated with the four queues that were provided um, by this specific provider. And realistically, we're trying the best that we possibly can to look at the applications on the left and put the ones that are close together um, that are, have the same basic requirements on the right. So if you notice, you see TCP for SP Critical 1, UDP for SP Critical 2, and so on. The next piece, realistically, is one of the best models that we have um, that are generally offered by providers. And QS guys love to work with this because it's flexible. It gives you just about everything you need in the network. So it's a six-class service provider model, which provides you with all the assured forwarding values, the DSCP value of, you know, of EF, CS5, 4, 3, 2, 1, all the way down to, to best effort. So it's really easy to map all of your values directly into um, the one on the right. Though, because we do have a pretty extensive 12 class model and we're going into a six class, what we're trying to do is essentially condense, again, light classes. So we have bulk data and scavenger, which go into a single class for their scavenger at 5%. Um, we have the management and we have media streaming and typical video in a single queue. So what we're trying to do, again, is establish a critical one, critical two, critical three that are all individually very similar to one another as far as traffic types. So when they flow through the provider, um, they don't interact uh, poorly with one another. The last piece here um, is based on Metro um, or sub-line rate access policies. Now, please do recognize that the switches um, up until the 3850, the next generation guy that just got released, um, generally do not support shaping. And so switches um, are really not supposed to be Metro E handoffs unless it's a 3750 Metro or some other Metro based switched. So the idea here is to look at a, a basic land card um, that has a subline rate that provides you with the capability of doing some hierarchical QS or some shaping like a SIP or SPA. Now in this case, um, we see the marking. We're going to trust DSCP 
Um, on the, the orange dot there, we're going to do queuing from the distribution or the core um, to this, or access to this guy. Um, and then we're going to trust the DSCP on the uplinks as the traffic flows through. Now, the HQOS capable is, that's a metro router. It uh, gives us the capability of looking at the VLANs and, and all the detail there. But realistically, all we're going to do from the access edge is trust that traffic coming in, make sure we queue it according to our WAN policy. Um, and then also, as we hand it off, we want to shape that, that traffic down on that metro router or that metro switch um, to the line rate. So again, if your provider offers you a 10 meg rate and you have a gig connection, if you send a gig into that 10 meg, it's free for all. The traffic is dropped randomly. You don't know if your voice packet, your video, or your data is going to get dropped. So you have to provide a shaper in order to provide back pressure and give class-based weighted fair queuing the, the chance to schedule the traffic out the basic shape rate of the port and into the cloud. So you're grooming the traffic to make sure that what goes out of your network is really what you want. Um, and that's the extremely important piece uh, of, of quality of service. All right, guys, so that's the, uh, the WAN QS design guidance. Um, I know it's very high level, but again, if you dig into this uh, design guide, um, they're all here. It's, all the details are here. Basically, it's around five to 600 pages if you really uh, uh, enjoy reading. Um, and uh, you, can, you can basically start from there and you know, send us questions if you have any. Um, also, there's a new book uh, that just came out, End-to-End -end Quality of Service Network Design. Um, this is going to cover all the next-gen quality of service, 3850, 5760 from a wireless perspective, um, the SOUP 8, the, and the, the, the basically the next generation switches and the current ones. Um, and it's the additional book, the second edition from the standard version um, that's been out for quite some time now. So uh, if you do have questions, feel free, grab that, take a look at it, and um, I'm sure it will answer your question. Thanks again. I appreciate that. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I um, don't get to uh, really dive into QoS as much as I'd like. Um, it ends up, you know, a lot of times, uh, that process is one of spending a lot of time looking at everything from TOS to uh, 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 QoS flags to, you know, building out to CBQoS class maps, and it always seems to be a challenge to get it to work right in practice. So um, I wanted to talk just r real briefly here about uh, monitoring QoS and the uh, uh, product that we offer to make that a little bit easier, um, especially with some of the uh, new features in 4.0. The uh, ideal monitoring really should provide st strati uh, statistics on both pre- and post-policy uh, traffic maps and traffic drops. And I'll get into drops in a minute, but again, uh, to reiterate, on um, the previous portion of this, drops versus queuing is really, really important. Um, and being able to see that is really the, those pre and post uh, class maps are really the only way to, to know how that's working. Um, policy validation is really important. You know, do the right conversations, um, are they getting the priority that you expect, especially with the increasing reliance on um, uh, highly compressed uh, data like video and more and more critical telepresence and uh, VoIP. And then, of course, um, uh, make sure, making sure that the tools have access to all of the uh, Cisco MIBs to be able to collect uh, the correct uh, uh, CBQOS and QoS policy data. And then, of course, fortunately, uh, NetFlow carries a lot of information on QoS per conversation. So um, the way that we pr uh, process this is actually with our uh, SolarWinds uh, NetFlow Traffic Analyzer product. And uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, it it operates uh, on two different levels. One of them, obviously, is taking advantage of Cisco's NetFlow um, protocol, and it actually has a collector which receives the NetFlow, um, just about any version of NetFlow you can think of. It's really easily configurable. And then in addition to that, it's using SNMP polling to collect CBQOS data off of the CBQOS MIB. Um, if you've ever tried to collect CBQOS data manually in uh, uh, command line, it can really kind of be a pain, so being able to automate that is really important. And then finally, being able to tie all of that together into a single view and then correlate those two values together is the key of the web interface. Um, main features there, I mean, it is an add-on to uh, our network performance monitor product. Um, it does, um, and I, I'd say most of our customers are primarily Cisco, but we do also support some of the other standards out of the box like SFlow. Uh, IP fix, JFlow, 
um, to be able to get um, all of the different uh, traffic metrics. Um, uh, another one of those that we recently added was sampled net flow. So if you have uh, 10G uh, networks and above where you really don't want to try to completely fire hose your collector with extremely um, high traffic uh, flows, but be able to still do, let's say, 95th uh, percentile reporting, that makes that really easy. And then, of course, it's using SNMP as well to do not only the performance reporting on the CBOQS policies, but you also then get all the performance data on the devices that are supporting those um, uh, the QoS, uh, not only the metrics, but providing QoS policies. So if you are doing a lot of queuing, for example, it's going to have an impact on uh, CPU and memory. It's nice to be able to monitor all of that in one place. The big news here is uh, with uh, NTA 4.0, um, we have completely overhauled the way that we are storing our metrics. Uh, before, there was sort of a mm, semi-hard limit of about 10,000 flows per second per collector. Um, we were using a, uh, a uh, relational database on the back end to store NetFlow data, and we finally realized that, one, we had customers that were getting to be pretty big and wanted to be able to support a whole lot more flows than that, but beyond that, being able to have one minute gra granularity for as long as you're willing to set up storage on a system is really important, especially when you're trying to co uh, correlate performance metrics between, let's say, the uh, NetFlow data, which is showing something really spiky that happened three days ago in a, in a help desk ticket versus the uh, interface uh, traffic uh, metrics for that, for that, that same uh, link. Uh, being able to not um, uh, average out that data into hourly or larger window chunks is the way that we do that. Um, so all, out of the box, it's now providing 5x uh, more uh, processing power much better performance out of the uh, web UI. And in addition to that, it speeds up all of your other Orion platform applications as well because it's moved the uh, NetFlow uh, history data out of, out of SQL Server, which also means you don't need a license uh, and a dedicated uh, SQL hardware to be able to store that. And in many cases, that represents the, uh, your traffic data may represent as much as 75 to 80% of a, a typical user's database. So that's a huge new upgrade in the latest version, and there's a, a bunch of videos online. I definitely recommend you check those out. QoS reporting is really handy, and especially because uh, in addition to being able to pull the basic policies that are applied to an interface, we also now support nested policy view and direction so that you can actually look at both inbound and outbound. And um, the uh, as I mentioned before, you get pre and post uh, uh, map uh, policy tracking. I'm actually going to show you that in a chart here in a second. And being able to see that on a class-by-class -class basis for each one of those policies, including nested policies, makes, visual, makes the time that you're spending creating these really nuanced uh, CBQOS class map uh, policies that should be working the way that you're expecting, but they are in fact working the way that you're expecting, the way you expect. Um, you also get great detail on drop traffic, and uh, that's uh, per interface, but also on a QoS class. And I mean, again, the main goal there is to be able to validate that your QoS strategy is in fact working the way that you expect it will. Um, I think most of you have probably already seen um, the uh, interface. You can also see this live if you want. Go check out our live demo. It's uh, oriondemo.solarwinds.com or just uh, visit the uh, NTA page on the solarwinds.com website. There's a link that'll take you to this. But in this view, what I wanted to demonstrate is that we're looking at uh, two, uh, a series of four, uh, well, a single policy with four classes designated. We've got streaming, low delay, uh, class default, and best effort. And we can actually see on the left-hand side here the uh, pre, and then on the right-hand side the post policy class map um, traffic that's, that's moving through that interface based on, that, based on those uh, policies. And then we can also see our CBQOS drop report which is really handy if you had discovered that all of a sudden you're dropping all of your executive wing telepresence data with hard drops instead of queuing. That can keep you out of an awful lot of trouble. Um, and then finally, uh, reporting with NTA, I mean, um, obviously we're supporting uh, flexible NetFlow as well as V5. Um, it includes the TOS information, which is really nice for each IP conversation. And using that along with the DSCP field reporting can really help identify mismarked IP traffic. And I think that was something Kim was talking about before. Um, it's, it's really important to make sure that it, your, 
you're marked correctly, and it's a great way to figure out where those mismatches are actually occurring in the, in the field. And then finally, of course, you can report on the essentials like uh, protocol application endpoints and conversations relative to each, uh, each uh, TOS. Ah, oh, a great question just popped in here, which is, does NTA cost more than NTA if we're already licensed? And the answer is, typical to SolarWinds, absolutely not. As long as you're on maintenance, you get all of that capability for free. And what it really means is that it's going to be decrease your overall operating costs for NetFlow at the same time that, for example, instead of storing 15 minutes, uh, details out of the box, you can it stores 30 days of detailed data out of the box. Um, and so definitely go uh, download the free functional 30-day trial if you don't already have it. Um, that's solarwinds.com slash NTA is the vanity URL for that. Um, you can also just Google SolarWinds NTA and you'll get right to it. Um, there are a number of videos and the links that are included here will be uh, uh, included in the uh, attached uh, slide deck so you can go right to those. And then um, if you're on the website and you're looking at uh, QoS, there's actually a whole description uh, page there of how NTA uh, supports QoS in the product. And of course, if you're not already a member of our uh, community of more than 150,000 folks on SWAC, definitely um, I would recommend that you do that. Spend a lot of time on our NTA forum. So even if you're not a customer, there are a number of folks out there who have gotten to be real gurus with working with NetFlow and um, uh, as well as uh, QoS and uh, QoS strategy on a day-to-day uh, -day basis on real live networks who can actually help you with questions as well as have a lot of interesting stories that you can read and check out directly. Um, if you have any questions, of course, uh, don't hesitate to uh, hit us up on Head Geeks. We're going to, on our uh, Twitter account, we're going to go over some questions here. Ken and I are going to take off of the list here in a second as well. And then, of course, you can always tweet us at SolarWinds. Okay, so um, one of them was that um, the RFC states that video conferencing should be in a non-EFQ. Well, what about um, audio um, in that video conferencing call? Should be okay. the same? Yeah, I, I can see them now. Yeah, so I mean, so the idea here is is that um, the RFC really, really is trying to again clean up the EFQ. Um, but if, if you want to segment the audio and the video pieces of it, you, you could actually through, so for instance, in a call manager, you can you mark the, the voice call, a voice call piece of the, the video phone call um, to EF and then the standard video to AF41. By default, they're marked the same as AF41. Um, a lot of customers may do that because if you have a voice call or a video call and the video gets a little jaggedy um, and the voice is directly there, it's always there. The call is usually more acceptable because if the voice is definitely protected, but the video is a little bit off, um, you can kind of deal with a bit of pixelation. Um, so it's okay to do that, uh, but again, it depends on. It really does depend on the business requirement. We've had customers do it both ways, but by default, Cisco marks the AF41 for you know your general uh, video calls so that they're aligned, they're in the same queue, they're in the same class. You don't have lip sync issues and things like that um, that you may run into if you do separate the two streams. Okay. Um, there was another one here that I, I liked, which was, what happens if you don't have CDP uh, coming out of the device? How do you implement uh, trust boundaries? Um, and the example that they gave was a uh, late polycom phone. All right. So, so in the instance of, um, of the lack of CDP, uh, to be honest, and CDP is a pretty lightweight protocol. Um, it's not incredibly secure, um, of course, as we all know. But uh, the reality is, is that if, if it doesn't support CDP, uh, you'll have to just apply a, a standard, you know, QoS-based policy on the physical port, and that's pretty simple to do. I mean, that's usually uh, the way that we did it previous to uh, a conditional trust. So just apply a simple a quality of service policy on the physical port, and, and you're pretty much good to go. You can match the traffic uh, based on ACL port range or DSCP values. Um, um, and depending on what the end device can actually send. Okay, so so first of all, EIGRP neighbor traffic. Um, so in general, we if you're dealing with a, a router, um, we have something called pack priority, and a lot of the traffic um, is generally marked. A lot of the uh, internal or uh, any of the uh, EIGRP or routing-based traffic and protocol traffic is usually marked CS6 internally. Um, if you're not able to, to classify that base CS6 and you're already having problems, if you can't and you just classify CS6 and 
allocate it to your network uh, management queue or your sorry your network control queue. Um, you could easily classify EIGRP itself um, with the standard ACL. Uh, usually that traffic, because it's locally generated, um, is again, it should be marked with PAC priority. Uh, and so it, it either, depending on your router platform, it's already protected, or um, if you're seeing the loss, uh, you should be able to classify it um, and then allocate its own, uh, its traffic to basically a, a network control queue. Um, and that's usually what a lot of customers do, especially with BGP. Um, where, where you do have to, uh, to classify that traffic specifically. Mm -hmm. There was a, a question here that I want to actually expand on and just make it a little bit more general, um, which is, you know, we a lot of times kind of rely on uh, uh, auto QoS. We know that customizing our QoS strategy can pay some real, real benefits. So what's the typical return like uh, on the investment in QoS? I mean, it, it obviously takes a, a while to implement it to discipline, uh, gear has to be compatible and you overall need to know what you're doing, so you are going to have to put some time into but really what is it, in, what's the comparative uh, benefit once you've taken the time to do it? Um, well, I mean, do you trust your police department? I mean, the reality is is that I, it's, it's hard to justify, to be honest. Um, basically, the, the thing that I'm trying to say is that uh, with quality of service, you have a guarantee. If you, if you provide it end to end, you know that um, at the end of the day when you call 911, the police will show up, right? Um, the reality is, is with quality of service end to end, um, you basically have a guarantee that applications will flow through. Now, it doesn't mean that you won't shoot yourself in the foot, but what it really means is that uh, you've provided yourself some sort of reasonable guarantee that if uh, a virus or if something, you know, somebody shoots off a... Uh, uh, back up during the middle of the day that because voice happens to be in the priority queue and this traffic was thrown in best effort and you have congestion, your voice calls are going to go through at the end of the day. If you don't enable quality of service end to end, um, there is no guarantee. That's the, the whole focus for quality of service. So as far as ROI, it's, it's hard, I think, to justify a number um, when it comes to quality of service, but if you don't implement it, it will bite you, and that's the problem. When you're dealing with voice and video these days, and you're looking at all these immersive applications, you're dealing with, uh, you know, Netflix, Hulu, um, all sorts of, you know, sharing programs, it's very difficult to determine, first of all, what's using your bandwidth without quality service, and it's very difficult to separate your business from your recreational traffic without doing that. So um, I would say it's, it's imperative but uh, I think it's hard to, to give a number or say what the ROI basically would be. Right. And it, yeah. I was going to say it requires a lot of discipline. And one of the things that we find uh, that our customers see a lot is there. it always seems to be uh, Friday at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon when something really critical is going on that you hit this tipping point where you've been watching it uh, on your instrumentation for a long time and thinking, well, you know, there's some – things that I could do here to really improve the service on the network, and I just need to make time to really sit down and, and take a proactive approach to my QoS management, and then that's when you you roll past that point, and all of a sudden it starts to have a lot of conflicts, and it usually doesn't start off getting a little bit uh, affected in one area. It gets bad all at once. So there's a, a question about Metro E with a subrate capability. Um, and if policing, if you're policing to limit traffic to 20 meg, so the, car uh, the carrier doesn't drop packets, will QoS policies be based on percentage of the max bandwidth allowed via policing? Uh, I'm not really sure. I mean, so if you're if you're policing, so first of all, if you have a metro link and you're policing, um, you won't be able to do class-based weighted fare directly into the policer. So in other words, you won't be able to allocate percentages. Um, for voice, video, or whatever under that police rate. Um, if you have a shaper at the parent, because uh, a shape, shaper buffers, which means you're allowing queuing, which means in the child of that policy, you'll have class-based weighted fair queuing, so you can say a percentage goes to my voice, a percentage goes to my video. Um, that's definitely, first of all, the way you'll want to do it. Um, perhaps I'm not reading it right, but that's, I mean, I, I kind of, I got that from the, the question there, it's stating policing to limit it. Um, but if you, even if you police the traffic as it leaves your box, it's randomly dropped based on the CIR. So anything above that 20 meg that you send is going to be dropped, whether it's voice, video, or data. It, it doesn't 
differentiate. You definitely want a shaper there. Okay. Well, let's just do one more question and then we'll uh, wrap this up and get to the drawing. And actually, a, a, a general question, it's something uh, one of the, uh, the attendees actually asked, but um, the specific question was, do multiple versions of QoS work with one another? But I think the bigger question is, obviously, there's a, uh, there has been increasing complexity with QoS um, over the last few years, and there seems to be an awful lot of work um, toward bringing all of that together and simplifying um, the management of QoS across uh, the enterprise network. Yeah, no, so I mean, so so definitely. I mean, in recent years, and um, we've been leading efforts to really align um, quality of service in general because, like I said, we, we kind of did away with MLS because we recognized that MLS itself um, on a per-platform basis really exposed the hardware um, to, the, to the customers. And so it makes it a bit more difficult for them to recognize and to understand QoS from end to end. Because on the 3750, we have SRR. On the, the 4K, we have, you know, whatever it happens to be. We use DVL there instead of weighted red and, and what have you. Um, the reason behind that is because we wanted to expose the best hardware to customers we possibly could at that time. Um, but in doing so, QoS being so tied to hardware specifically became increasingly complex, right? So um, if you upgrade from one version of, of iOS to the next, I mean, generally, you'll have the same set of QoS. You may just get uh, some new features, just like any other uh, sort of uh, app, or sorry, any sort of feature. But if you move from platform to platform, it, it may be different. So again, as, as you stated, in recent years, we've really tried to do away with that. So we have MQC, which is a, a class map policy map sort of function. It's a, it's a unified provisioning language that we've provided now across all the platforms at Cisco. So the 3850, the 4K with SOUP6, the SOUP2T on the 6K, Nexus, um, even XR, any platform in the XR, like the CRS, they all use MQC. So at least the provisioning is the same. But still, because QoS is still tied to hardware, you're going to have different capabilities. And the reason for that is because you really need different capabilities on a CRS than you would a 3750 at the access edge, right? So. Um, MQC is there to really help people, so hopefully that does help people understand how to provision quality service end to end, and it, it's a bit easier for them because at least they get the structure. But the features and the functions um, are definitely still going to be different, varying on platforms, because again, um, places in the network require different things. So, yeah, I, I, that's a really good question. That's awesome. Well, I, that's gonna that's gonna wrap us up. Thanks again for attending. I'm Patrick Hubbard, and um, have a great afternoon.